Thank you very much. So uh, that, that was a very kind introduction. Um, yeah, welcome also from my side. Um, I'm Lars, I will be presenting today. Um, and what I'll be presenting today is, is very much joint work with uh, Teresa Freitas Montero. Um, our project is titled Barriers to Humanitarian Migration, Victimization and Integration Outcomes. Um, we have taken on board a lot of comments we have received on this work over the past couple of months. So I'm, I'm, I'm quite excited to present to you the latest iteration of this paper today. And uh, yeah, let's just uh, jump right into it. So uh, before I go into the academic relevance of our project, um, let me first start out by, by motivating this project a little bit from a policy angle, uh, since I think this is what we should ultimately get us thinking. Um, so on the one hand, we all know that by now, by, we all know by now how, how grueling uh, of a journey it is for asylum seekers to make it to Europe. Um, just to give you a short reminder here, according to the IOM's missing migrant database, uh, 15,000 people died in the Mediterranean alone between 2015 and 2019 uh, when, when trying to reach the, the, the territory of the EU. And uh, those who make it through generally don't come out unscathed. Um, recent research documents uh, well that both smugglers and um, border police are perpetrators of violence and uh, inflict this violence on, on these asylum seekers. Um, on the other hand, we all know how much importance decision makers in Europe attached to the successful integration of refugees. Um, the background here is, of course, that, that refugee employment and employment quality is still much worse than that of other migrants. And to improve the uh, social standing of refugees and as, uh, also, of course, um, for public finance considerations, um, in particular, the economic integration of refugees is considered very important. Um, but well, once we consider these two phenomena in con con conjunction, so the, the dangerous journey on the one hand and the integration ambitions on the other hand, it quickly becomes quite clear that, that they are not independent. So even if the Europe, even, even, even at this stage, the European Commission clearly states that by now uh, the, that the, the journey uh, refugees have to go through is, is certainly uh, not helping their integration and uh, increases the risk developing uh, all kinds of mental health issues. Um, this could, of course, be considered somewhat schizophrenic, uh, given that the migration barriers we put into place ourselves uh, to prevent migration to Europe are directly linked to these difficulties uh, asylum seekers have during their journey. But uh, this policy dimension is not the main angle of this talk today. Uh, we will just touch upon this a bit later. Um, so yeah, what do we do in this project? Um, what we do is we're trying to tie these two phenomena together. Uh, we analyze the effect of victimization events asylum seekers endure um, during their journey and uh, link these to economic outcomes in Germany. Uh, Germany because it was the main recipient country of asylum seekers over the past years in Europe. Um, yeah, to do so, we use three waves of the ERB bump uh, sub we call survey data um, where refugees were interviewed um, uh, between 2016 and 2018, and uh, refugees were chosen based on the time of arrival. So refugees uh, that arrived between 2013 and 16 are included in the survey. And the survey includes specific information on victimization events um, asylum seekers went through during their, their flight to Europe. Uh, we mostly use this survey, so the, 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 the ERB BAMF GSOP survey, also to analyze the economic outcomes of interest, but we then also link it to employment biographies, uh, that's administrative data stored at the ERB to, to verify our results. Um, well, just to, to anticipate our main results a little bit, what we find is that victimization during the journey causes little to no distortion in the general decision to become economically active in Germany. Uh, but we, what we do detect is a strong distortion around the timing of entering into econo economic activity. So what happens is that physically victimized refugees take up low income employment in much larger shares than others and invest significantly less into host country specific education. And as I will uh, talk about later on, we con conceptualize this finding as a loss of future directedness, uh, which can be thought of as the loss of interest uh, within this victimized group compared to other groups in what happens uh, to their future. 
So yeah, let me let me uh, first address uh, how we derive the the research hypothesis that we that we actually then test empirically with with our data. Um, so so mainly there are two clear hypotheses that can be derived from the literature, and one relates to findings from the general population, and one is very specific to the situation of newly arrived refugees. And uh, I'd like to start out with what we know from studies on the general population, because I think this is also what most of you will be intuitively thinking. Um, it is well documented by this research that uh, in the general population, and, and here what I'm listing is, is only really selected studies and references in the paper, we, we uh, discuss uh, many more of them. Um, these studies show that there's a strong negative causal link between victimization and all kinds of, of negative outcomes you can think of in terms of lower labor market attachment, lower income, higher welfare dependency, and so on. And the reason for this link, so, so the, the kind of structural mechanism, if you will, is found in the negative consequences uh, of victimization events uh, for the mental health of victims. Um, in particular, physical assault and, and, and rape have strong uh, negative effects on mental well being. And then in turn, this decrease in mental well being. Uh, has been linked to lower labor market attachment, uh, lower educational attainment, and uh, that has been done in numerous studies. So the evidence base for, the, for this general population, and that's again quite intuitive, I think, is pretty straightforward. Um, victimized refugees are expected to be less attached to the labor market and invest less into education than uh, non-victimized refugees uh, due to their lower mental health. And uh, this kind of effect um, that we derive from the general population, uh, we call the extensive margin of economic activity, uh, which is basically the hypothesis stating that um, we expect a general decrease in activity um, of these uh, victimized refugees. So this is kind of the first bit. Um, but well, it, it turns out that this is really not the whole story when it comes to refugee, refugees. Um, and the, the main reason for that is that the um, so, so yeah, let me, let me maybe, maybe tell you here that, that if, if one of us got victimized um, and, and endured the same kind of uh, treatment that, that many asylum seekers endure during their journey, um, what would probably happen on average, at least not depending on all kinds of other factors, of course, but on average, what would happen uh, to us is that we would be more likely to endure job loss, uh, we, would more, we would be more likely uh, to have lower educational attainment than others and so on. But this is this is really um, only half of the stories, story if you're in a situation uh, that, that, that refugees find themselves in, uh, because their uh, start is, is very different and they start a new life and their economic tra tra trajectory is at zero, right? So they can't really lose their employment or um, um, uh, become unemployed because they come into the country having basically uh, starting, starting with, with, with absolutely nothing. So, and, and, and this has been conceptualized well um, in the literature, refugees basically have two choices upon arrival. Um, they can either take up low paid work or invest into host country specific education to get to then get access to better quality jobs later on. And the reason the refugees face this choice is because they mostly originate from countries where educational degrees face a pretty heavy discount um, in the more developed regions of the world. So if you take, for example, a Syrian uh, structural engineer, uh, that person will most likely struggle to find employment as a structural engineer in Germany, uh, just because uh, their degrees that get discounted and it will take uh, years of, tra of retraining um, to get back to the same kind of job the person held um, at their origin. And this is kind of where it gets interesting also in the literature. So there's strong suggestive evidence in, in psychology literature that victimized individuals lose their willingness to go through this kind of education and training required uh, to get this access to, to, to better paid jobs. Um, and instead they take on low income employment fast. Uh, so, so for example, and, and we will actually show very similar results in a bit, um, there's a study by Hauf and, 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 and Wecklum who show that refugees in Norway who were traumatized either in their country of origin or during a flight uh, show a much higher labor force participation than um, comparable refugees who were not traumatized. And that is uh, one year and three years after arrival. And the reason and that is that is posited quite strongly by the psychology and the psychiatric literature is a so-called loss of future directiveness. So what the literature shows is that victimization leads to a passive approach to life among refugees 
And instead of, instead of investing into their future by going through education in the host country first, uh, victimized individuals are then more likely to simply accept the discount on their foreign degrees and take up low school employment. Uh, quite sadly, uh, you can even see this lack of future orientation um, in, in uh, studies on, on suicide among vulnerable populations. And these, these, these results show that uh, the documented, documented incidence of uh, suicide among victimized refugees is higher than among non-victimized refugees. Um, so you can, you can basically think of this, and this is of course a, a kind of a, a dark take, but um, you can think of this as the, the most extreme lack of future directiveness, uh, of course, when, when um, a suicide seems to be the, the, the only way out. Um, so these kind of findings combined uh, lead us to, to our second research hypothesis, which is that victimized refugees are expected to be more likely to join the labor force rather than investing into host country specific education. Uh, all of this always compared to the non-victimized uh, population. Okay, so now that I've set this up, uh, just a few more words about the, the data. Uh, again, as I already said, we draw all our information uh, on, on refugees from three waves, wave, waves of the um, of the EAB bump sub refugee panel survey. Uh, we only take, I should mention this here already, um, into consideration refugee into consideration refugees between 18 and 65, so those who can uh, theoretically join the labor force. Um, of these uh, three waves, uh, these three survey waves, 58% uh, of the respondents agreed to give details on their journey experience. Uh, so this includes the victimization experience. And this gives us uh, 2,622 uh, unique individuals that we have all information on, um, many of which are followed over time by the survey. And uh, to improve on this uh, further, as I, as I already said, we also link these uh, surveyed individuals to employment biography data stored at the EAB. And then finally, to, to complement our analysis, we also gather information on the situation at the origin of refugees. So we create a, a conflict intensity measure for each individual, which is just a, a fatality count on the province level um, in the three months prior to, to migration. Um, but this is really just to get a, a control variable for, for victimization at the origin. We are in this project mostly interested in what's happening uh, during the journey. Okay, um, then uh, this is probably kind of kind of uh, the, the elephant in the room so far. Um, so, so how do we measure asylum seeker victimization uh, during their journey? Um, so we create two measures for that. One is a physical victimization indicator that just simply takes the value one if an individual reports that he or she was uh, subjected to either sexual, uh, sexual abuse, physical attacks, uh, incarceration, um, or shipwreck, or any combination of these. And the other one is a financial victimization indicator, which takes the value one if an individual uh, went through financial fraud, uh, exploitation, extortion, robbery, or blackmail. And, um, and um, let me just uh, say right here before I show the summary statistics on that, um, these are not mutually exclusive, right? So of course you can go through financial victimization and physical victimization at the same time. Uh, here is, is a quick overview about a bit more than one third of, of our sample um, went through such experiences, um, uh, got financial, uh, financial victimization rate stands at 38%, physical victimization rate is slightly lower at 36%, and among uh, financial victimization, the most common uh, way of, of being victimized is fraud, so presumably when, when um, smugglers are being paid for, for uh, services that they did not deliver, and it's a bit more balanced among the physical victimization. So there you have uh, physical attack, shipwreck, and incarceration uh, making up for the, the main share of physical uh, victimization. Right, uh, then how do we measure refugee integration? So that's kind of our outcome variable. Um, so what we do in order to test the, the uh, hypothesis on the external margin of economic activity, uh, we create an economic activity indicator that, that takes the value one if an individual is either inside the labor force or pursues host country specific education or training and zero otherwise. Uh, again, that means basically that the idea behind this indicator is to capture people that are either economically active at the moment or plan to be economically active um, in the future. So we wanna combine these two for this external margin effect. Uh, then for the internal margin effect, we separate these two out. So we have an indicator for the labor force 
and one for pursuing host country specific education. And then uh, as you will re see the, the most interesting results uh, come from this internal margin of, of economic activity. Uh, and that's why we also extend the analysis to employment, the type of employment and wages earned to shed more light on um, the mechanisms at hand and to kind of substantiate the claim that people when they're victimized are more likely to actually take up um, low income employment instead of investing into the future. Okay, here's are just the summary statistics. Um, about 77% of the working age population uh, is either at, at the moment economically active or uh, plans to be economically active. And um, as you can see in the, so that's the, the, the first line and the, 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 the second and the third line here shows you the labor force participation standing at around 75% and educational training at around 8%. These are summary statistics uh, from roughly three years uh, into the stay of refugees. And as you can also see due to the, uh, the, the German system of dual education uh, with the apprenticeship system, uh, some of this education and training and, and labor force participation have an overlap. So you can be in both. Uh, then of those who are in the labor force, and uh, sorry, no, these statistics are actually on the whole sample. Um, so about 22% three years into their stay are, uh, of, of these refugees are employed. And um, of these, about half are full-time employed and 11% and are part-time or marginally employed, leading to a pretty low net income of around 880 euros on average. Um, then, okay, so then what, what do we do empirically to actually test our hypothesis? So here is our benchmark specification uh, that, that models uh, the association um, between on the left-hand side, which is our outcomes of interest, and um, on the, sorry, our outcomes and on the right-hand side, the physical victimization and the financial uh, victimization variable. So the gamma one and the gamma two, which are the coefficients on these two are in the end, the coefficients of interest. Um, even in this baseline, we control for a range of uh, characteristics. So baseline characteristics just include stuff like age at the time of arrival, um, gender and so on. Uh, Pre-migration characteristics, uh, um, we are lucky to have a lot of them in the survey so we can, we have information um, on backward reported health. We have uh, information on backward reported income, the economic situation at the time uh, before migration, and uh, even stuff like life satisfaction before migration and so on. And of course, also the, 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 the origin and the region of origin of people. Then uh, next control is our conflict intensity measure at the origin. And we also control for some variables that are um, um, that, that capture the time after arrival. So that's the asylum status of people. That's a categorical variable, whether or not someone has uh, asylum status, which is important for the labor market access. We control for the time the person has spent in the country. So this MSM stands for the number of months that, uh, that uh, asylum seekers or refugees have spent in the country. And its square term is the, the next variable. Uh, then we include a country of origin fixed effect such that we only uh, compare people within the same uh, group of uh, country of origin. So basically Syrian victimized people are only compared to um, Syrian non-victimized uh, refugees. And the last term, the Delta F is just a German federal state fixed effect. Uh, that's due to the noise that is created by um, this allocation mechanism that Germany has in place. So asylum seekers are not uh, free to move their, their, their uh, allocated into uh, German federal states. And to add some precision to our estimates, we, we add this as a, as a control. And then we cluster our standard errors, it's not mentioned here, cluster them on the household level to allow for the fact that um, these errors might be correlated within households uh, because people travel together and they may have uh, been uh, victimized for unobservable reasons that are uh, because simply because they were in the same household. Right. Um, let me then quickly talk to you about some of the empirical challenges that we face if we actually want to have, want to, want to get closer to a causal interpretation of this gamma one and gamma two, which capture the main um, coefficients of interest. Um, so in, in, in our setting, um, we need to be very careful about three sources of bias in the, estimation, in the estimates of, of, of gamma one and gamma two, uh, when we're trying to assess the effect of victimization on these, on these integration outcomes. And let me just quickly walk you through um, and illustrate why this is the case and why we need to uh, be kind of smart about our empirical specification to actually get out of this uh, exercise what we actually want to get out. So the first relates to selection. The first problem relates to the selection at the country of origin. So this means that uh, changes in the risk of migration to Germany may affect the, the group composition of migrants who choose to embark on the journey to Germany in the first place. 
And we don't really know what kind of effect there is on these, these changes in risk on this group composition, uh, composition a priori. So to, to, to let, me, let me just illustrate this, imagine the European Commission decides that uh, Frontex should no longer rescue migrants uh, crossing the Mediterranean, which increases the risk of, of shipwreck and, and therefore of, of victimization. But at the same time, some people will no longer choose to migrate now with this increase in risk. And uh, the subset of migrants that is still willing to take the higher risk is likely to be non-random. So now uh, only those with the, with the highest willingness to take risk um, um, will take the risk to try and make it. Uh, but they will also get victimized in higher numbers because they're less likely to be, be uh, rescued on the Mediterranean now. And then the victimization event would, would mostly proxy the willingness to take risk. And, and, and we are not so interested in this, and at least not in this, in this particular study. Um, the second then relates to omitted variable bias. Here, it's about unobserved individual level uh, characteristics that affect uh, how asylum seekers manage to navigate the journey. And that may also coincide with uh, the integration success in the destination country. So here you could basically think of a very smart person who manages to easily get through the journey without being victimized. And that person would then also be more likely to make better employment decisions in the host country. And um, the victimization measure would then just pick up this kind of IQ advantage of the person, which again, we are not very interested in. And the last one is the so-called survivor bias. Um, so at any given journey level, uh, journey risk level, um, only a share of migrants uh, will make it to Germany and only these are observed in our sample. Again, think of an example where the risk is very high and only very few asylum seekers make it through. These would then most likely, uh, these, these, sorry, these would then more, be more likely to, to get victimized uh, due to the, to the high risk, but um, they're also the most resilient ones. So, so in this case, the higher victimization rate would then uh, to some extent capture the resilience of people, again, something we're not so interested in. So these three problems we kind of have to get around. And um, some of them are quite easy to solve and, and some of them are not so easy. So the first one is, is the selection at the origin. Uh, so what we do here, we can just include fixed effects for that interact the, the, the region of origin. So people where people come from uh, with the time of departure. So basically what, what this ensures is that we only compare people, say from Syria, who migrated in a specific month. Uh, so all comparisons of physical victimization uh, of people physically and financially victimized to the non-victimized uh, only happen within these narrow categories. So we can rule out that, that, that it's driven by selection at the origin. And you will see later that it actually doesn't really make a big difference to our estimates. So the selection at the origin is not really a huge concern. So the risk um, of the journey doesn't drive this selection so much. Uh, for the omitted variable bias, again, that pertains to the fact that, that victimization and integration could be co-determined. Uh, we can minimize this by controlling for this very rich set of, of, of relevant pre-migration um, observable variables. Uh, so I already mentioned some of them, and I will, so, uh, I will show you a little bit of an overview about this uh, in, in a bit. Um, and the way we select these control variables is, is first of all theory driven. So we, we know that there's some literature on this and uh, we use this literature to, to select these control variables, but we also use a machine learning approach, which is more data driven. So there we allow basically the data to pick um, which um, control variables are most relevant. And finally, for the survivor bias, again, that pertains to the, to the lack of observations of individuals uh, who didn't make it through to Germany at, at a given uh, journey, journey risk. And this one is a bit underexplored in the literature, and that's why we conduct our own little experiment on this. So what we show is that arrival cohorts uh, do differ on, in their composition, at least on observables. Of course, we can't test this on unobservables. But even when we control for the departure cohort, so when we only compare people from Syria who migrated in August 2015, we would still find that some people are more likely to make it through to Germany um, uh, compared to others. And let me just quickly show you how we do that. So we, what we do is we, we exploit a policy change uh, in Germany that decreased the risk for people to, to enter Germany, um, namely in September, uh, to, uh, in September 2015, uh, Angela Merkel told Hungary and Austria to let um, asylum seekers pass through their territory so they can claim asylum in Germany. And interestingly, what happens in response to that, when you look at this graph here, um, first of all, what happened is that the share of people who experienced physical trauma went down. So um, the red line here, so that the x-axis indicates uh, the time dimension, and then the red line, uh, the, the, the red vertical line shows you the time of the policy change. So what happened after it was made easier to asylum seekers, the share of um, 
people who experienced physical trauma went down. Um, that was driven by people who were no longer incarcerated or physically attacked. So that makes sense because this abuse is documented well at the Hungarian external border. Um, it is not driven by shipwreck, which also makes sense because uh, there is no sea between Hungary and Germany. Um, also, what you can see that the, the share of people who experienced financial trauma went down a little bit. Uh, that is most likely due to the fact that people no longer had to um, rely on, on, on smugglers. And what it does in terms of the composition of people is quite interesting in itself. So what you can see is that once the risk decreases, the share of people that are classically or traditionally considered um, vulnerable, uh, so female and, and uh, female asylum seekers and migrants, that share goes up right after this, this uh, policy change happened. Uh, so the number of, of females as a share of the total population uh, went up and then the, the uh, average number of, child, of, of children of, of these new arrivals um, went up. Um, and at the same time, the, the, the reason why people came is still the same. So they still come for humanitarian reason, reasons and uh, they still come and they still get their asylum granted. So basically, um, the, 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 we're still facing genuine asylum seekers. It's not that, that now like some economic, economic migrants use this opportunity to sneak in. No, um, this, is, um, this is really just that more vulnerable people can uh, manage to make it in now. Okay, um, so, so this is of course just on the observables, like what we're really worried about is the unobservable characteristics that may change. And in order to do that, we again apply a fixed effects, effects approach. So basically what we do then is we interact the country of origin with the time of departure and the time of arrival in Germany. So now we are only looking into comparisons within people that uh, migrated at the same time from the same country and arrived at the same time in Germany. Um, what's also informative in this context is to compare a little bit how um, these physically uh, financially victimized uh, people, how they differ from uh, asylum seekers, how they differ from a non-victimized population. And you can see here, just to give you a quick overview in the, in, the, in the paper, we have a much longer discussion on this. You can see here that this is already indicative of a selection effect, right? So here you can see that the people with no trauma on, on average were older, like roughly 34 years compared to 31.6 years. Uh, we're more likely to be female uh, than male, so male, uh, the male population um, was more likely to get victimized. And uh, of course, these are kind of indications that, 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 that this is not really because these asylum seekers were specifically targeted, but rather that at different uh, migration risks, people are more likely to get victimized, and then different people um, migrate at that given risk. And what you can also see here, what's quite interesting is that people who use smugglers, uh, so that's the, uh, the third to last line here, um, are more likely to be physically traumatized. And of course, people who use the plane to come to, to Germany are much less likely to get physically victimized. Uh, you have weaker effects of this um, for, the, for the financially victimized individuals. Uh, so I will not go through this in detail, but again, uh, we, are, we are currently um, finalizing the draft. So we are happy to, to share this with you if, if this is of interest. Um, okay, let me then jump right into our main results because I think uh, if, I, if I check the time, uh, we have about 10 minutes, so that's, that's great. So um, we, then we start out with the, with the external margin of economic activity. And what you can see here, um, I should say first that the cross-sectional results refer to people who spend roughly three years in the country. And the panel data then basically just follows these same people over time. So from an earlier point in time, when we first observed them, that's roughly uh, one and a half years into their stay in, in the country. And um, what you can see here, when you, when you look at the results at the external margin of economic activity, it's already not what we expect, right? We, we posited in our hypothesis that um, people would be less attached to the labor market and less likely to invest into host country education. It's not what we observe here. What we, we can see here, and I will only refer to the, the second column here because that's, that's um, we refer to that as our preferred specification in the paper. Um, what you can see here is that people who are physically victimized uh, are about 3.6 percentage points more likely to be either in labor force or pursue education. Um, that's not as strongly, that's not very strongly statistically, statistically significant, but it should tell you already that there's something more in the data than just this effect on, um, on, on, on um, mental well being that then leads to a lower labor market attachment. We find no such results at all for, financial uh, for financially victimized um, asylum seekers. So now let's get to the slightly more interesting part. 
So when we look, when we zoom into labor force participation at such, you can see that these results get much stronger and also much larger. So again, if we look at the situation of asylum seekers three years into their stay in, 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 in Germany, it's column two, our preferred specification, um, the, the, the propensity of victimized, physically victimized asylum seekers or refugees to join the labor force is 5.5 percentage points higher. So that's a pretty sizable effect. And that, that basically is consistent and, and robust in any kind of specification we tried. And we tried a lot of them because we couldn't really believe these results um, in the beginning. And we were, we, were, we were obviously thinking about a lot of reasons for that. Uh, so we tried everything, but uh, it, it seems to be a very robust result. Now, if you turn to, turn to the people to, that are in education and training, you could basically see the absolute opposite effect of that. So in our preferred specification, three years into their stay, people um, are more than three percentage points less likely to be in education or training if they have been physically victimized. So that basically goes hand in hand with this uh, hypothesis of people uh, losing their sense of future and being less future oriented when it comes to their investment. Um, we want to look at this into, a, we're going to go into this in a little bit more detail now. And um, from what we said earlier, remember in our hypothesis, we, we, we claimed, okay, if these people are less future oriented and their, their, their educational degrees that get discounted, we would expect them to work in, in jobs that allow them to work there um, without having any kind of degree. Uh, so, so that's kind of like low skill, uh, low income employment. So that's what we are looking at in the next step. And what you can see here, uh, first of all, in the, in the left column where we only presenting our preferred specifications, um, for any kind of employment, you can indeed see that physically victimized people, when they're in the labor force, they are more likely to take up employment. So the any employment uh, columns here clearly indicate that, that uh, if people got physically victimized, they're more likely to be in employment. But this kind of employment is not driven or to a very small extent driven by full-time employment. That's not even statistically significant from zero. Um, it's mostly driven by part-time or marginal employment. So people who enter the labor market very quickly uh, tend to only engage in part-time or marginal work. And then uh, I can show you also the effect on income. Uh, unfortunately, I couldn't run, uh, we couldn't run this on, on, the, on, on, on all our uh, different specifications because it's computationally uh, quite intense. But this is just our, our preferred specification that I wanted to show you. So you can even already see that in, in terms of income. So uh, this is the lock of income on the, on the left-hand side in our regression. So what you can see here is that if you're physically victimized, um, if you were physically victimized during the journey, three years into your stay, you're about, you earn about 25% less than um, a non-physically uh, victimized person. And again, we don't find anything among the financially victimized. Okay, so as I said, our findings lend quite strong support to the hypothesis of distortion around this decision to enter into low paid uh, marginal employment rather than investing into host country specific ed education. Um, unfortunately, we cannot and directly test this mechanism, right? Like ideally we would have a variable in there that asks people, um, so, so uh, how do you think about the future? Or what, is, what is your assessment of the future? Um, we, we, can't, we don't have this variable in there, so we can't unfortunately show you the results on that. But what we can do is we can, we can kind of substantiate our theory about this uh, by ruling out alternative mechanisms. And these alternative mechanisms, these are, these are alternative explanations to the effect we, we find, and we structure them around three components. So this mental well-being, uh, institutional mechanisms, and behavioral mechanisms. And let me just kind of uh, quickly, in the last five minutes of the presentation, let me just quickly walk you through them. So um, what we see here is when we look at life satisfaction at the time of arrival as an outcome, uh, we see that physically victimized individuals seem to be uh, much less happy with their life. We use this, this measure of life satisfaction because it's kind of this encompassing measure of mental well-being. And in our preferred specification on a scale of one to 10, uh, physically victimized individuals are roughly 0. Uh, 17, uh, points, uh, uh, report a lower life satisfaction of 0. 0.70 points than other non-victimized individuals. Um, of course, again, so this kind of indicates this, this mental well-being aspect. So that's, that's clearly there. So people, people report a lower mental well-being. Now, um, again, this could speak to both hypotheses that we posited in the beginning, right? So people could, because of that, be uh, show a lower attachment to the labor market or um, 
or have this kind of lack of future directedness. Um, so it's a bit of an ambiguous finding, but I, we still want to show you that uh, this mental well-being is indeed affected. And you can use other variables for that. So here we have uh, health satisfaction at the time of arrival, which is also clearly lower among the victimized than among the non-victimized. And here we can also see a bit of an effect um, on the financially victimized indeed. Okay, then what kind of other explanations could there be uh, that explain these results? Well, um, let me just first talk about the institutional mechanisms that would explain that. And, and there are basically two reasons why our main results of this faster employment take up uh, among the victimized could be explained by uh, design features of the German asylum system. So that is, that is really like something that is specific to the German asylum system. And the first one is that depending on where exactly you get, you get victimized uh, during the journey, um, you may have a more genuine case for asylum, and uh, you may therefore go through the asylum procedure faster, which also kind of leads to less scarring, um, that has been shown in a, in, a, in, a, in a study published in Science recently, that people who are, out of, uh, who are out of the labor force for longer are also less likely to then be attached to the labor market later on. Um, so what is what is the kind of what, what do we have in mind here? So if you say if you're say Syrian and you get victimized already while you're still in Syria um, on your way to Germany. That would mean that you have a more genuine uh, case for asylum because you get victimized in your country of origin and you can't be sent back there. And then if, you, uh, if you're more likely to, to get victimized for that reason, we would expect you to have a more genuine case uh, for asylum and enter the labor market faster. The second one is that, um, and that's, that's again very specific to Germany, um, obtaining employment before asylum can actually improve the chances of um, receiving employment later on. And um, so here, it is a bit more. The, the reasoning is a bit more convoluted. But what we what we have in mind here is basically that people um, who have a higher willingness to make it to Germany, so who are willing to take that risk and are therefore more likely to get victimized, um, also maybe have a more economic drive on top of their humanitarian reason to do so. So they would would, would like to go to Germany for economic reasons on top of uh, these humanitarian reasons, which would then lead to a faster take up of employ employment. Fortunately, our data allows us to test these two hypotheses. So what you can see here is, first of all, um, that physically victimized are not more likely to get their asylum granted. So uh, that hypothesis is out of the window. They're actually less likely to get their um, asylum granted. And their length of the asylum procedure in, in months is roughly the same as, as that of, of non-victimized. Unfortunately, we can't test this for the whole sample because these variables are not reported for all of them. But it's, it's, it's quite indicative uh, that this, this hypothesis doesn't play a role. Then regarding the timing of migration, uh, sorry, the timing of employment take up, what we would expect if, if um, physically traumatized or physically victimized people, uh, we call it trauma here, but it's the same variable. Um, if what, what we would expect here is that physically victimized individuals would uh, take up employment before they actually get their asylum granted. And what you can see here on the x-axis is the time since asylum and before asylum. So minus 20 is when the first people arrive. So that's 20 months before asylum. And the zero is the time of asylum. And you can see that at the time of asylum, the employment rates among physically traumatized or physically victimized and non-victimized is pretty much exactly the same. And uh, is very low at around uh, two percentage points. So that is not really a reason. And the same goes for uh, financial victimization. There we can barely see any difference. But for the physic uh, physical trauma, you can clearly see here that when we follow individuals over time using the, the, the employment biographies, you can see that their employment um, rate then quickly picks up after they get their asylum granted. So this hypothesis is also not a concern. OK, um, I think I'm running out of time, but let me just uh, spend one minute on the behavioral mechanisms. So, so one, one concern here is basically that um, the, 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 what our data shows us is that physically and financially victimized asylum seekers are paid more to, uh, to, to, to human smugglers uh, than non-victimized migrants. And we fear that this could lead them to take up um, employment faster upon arrival because they're um, more likely to experience financial hardship just simply because they, they, they paid more. At the same time, these smugglers are known to be perpet perpetrators of violence, so it makes sense that they would then also be victimized in higher numbers. So that's the first concern. The second concern is that people, when they get victimized, are actually put off from staying in Germany. So um, they're put off from, 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 um, from staying there for longer because they've been victimized. And that shortening of their intended stay would also mean that long-term investments into education don't really make sense anymore because they want to leave early anyway. 
So these two mechanisms we have to test. And fortunately, again, our data allows us to test this. For the financial hardship, uh, people are asked at the time of arrival uh, whether or not they're very worried about their finances. And what we can see here that uh, this is not really the case for uh, physically victimized individuals. We, we find a weak effect for the financially victimized, uh, which kind of makes sense, of course, because they uh, lost money during their journey because they were, uh, to some extent, um, ripped off by smugglers. They were, they were, uh, you know, robbed or mocked on the way, and so they lost some money. Uh, so, so, so for them to to go through more financial hardship is, is, is kind of a sensible finding. Uh, we don't really find anything for the physical victimization where we would expect it if our hypothesis was to be true. Uh, for the attention to remain in Germany, well, we find uh, that if I, if I can, I can uh, draw your attention to column two here again, uh, we find that um, there's basically no effect on the attention to uh, remain in Germany for both physically and financially victimized um, individuals upon arrival. And, um, that effect only in column three becomes slightly larger for the physically victimized once uh, we go through this over time effect. Uh, we don't think that's very particularly useful here. We, we still show it uh, because you know once people stay for longer in the country, uh, this kind of intention to remain becomes convoluted with other outcomes, right? So um, it becomes more likely that you want to stay in the country if you already have a job or if you're already in education. So it's not particularly telling us very much. Um, the main result here is column uh, one and two, and here we can really see no effect that um, physically victimized individuals would uh, stay or would intend to stay for a, a, a lower period of time, a shorter period of time in uh, Germany. Okay, uh, that's it. So uh, let me just conclude. Um, so our findings lend very strong uh, support to the hypothesis that victimization indeed distorts the human capital investment decision. So people, victimized individuals favor low income employment over um, over uh, host country specific educational investment, and we think that the, the, the main driver of this is this uh, loss of future directedness that has been found in the in the psychological literature multiple times, um, and that driver is the stronger driver compared to this. Um, effect that we would expect from pure uh, mental health related issues which which posit a lower labor market attachment. Uh, we do not find anything like that for financially victimized refugees, which is also kind of when we, when we dive into the literature on victimization, we saw that you know these financial victimization events are not perceived as severe as physical victimization. So that makes sense that, that it, it traumatizes um, individuals less. Um, but of course, these people do experience financial hardship if they, if they were financially victimized. Um, what like on the policy dimension, and it's the last thing I'm going to say, um, it, all our findings kind of really cast doubt on the swift employment uh, premise uh, as a, a primary success metric for refugee integration. So uh, as we have seen, like the swift employment can also be an unintended consequence of barriers to migration. So if you take an extreme example, if you make it very hard to come, and everyone who comes here gets gets uh, physically traumatized. They lose their um, they lose their their future directedness and, and kind of just live in the present and take up low skill employment. Well, you will find that people um, take up employment faster, but but it's not exactly an outcome that you would want. And even if you're like a stone cold um, economist, you would, would would still see that this distortion that that becomes visible because people get victimized and and only um, engage in low income work will at a later stage show in wealth for losses in the country because of course if an engineer works as an engineer that person will earn more income and pay more taxes so there's also this economic dimension to it uh, but with that said i think i'm already slightly over time and uh, yeah let me thank you very much for your attention and yeah looking forward uh, to your questions if you have any thank you thank you very much lars for the presentation and let's open the floor uh, right away for any questions and discussions uh, you may un unmute yourself and ask the question, but you could also write the question in the chat box and I'll read it out uh, for Lars and Teresa. All right, maybe I will just kick off with a, with a question while others um, are, are thinking. So I, I have a couple of questions actually, um, but more on the trauma events. So thanks, this is really, really interesting and I think very useful for our understanding of, of the situations of refugees and definitely for integration issues and outcomes. So um, these, these negative events that they have come into contact with 
do you have information on the survey? Because right now you're using everything dichotomously, right? Like it happened or it didn't happen. Um, but for some people, they have multiple trauma events also, right? Um, uh, and like, and is there any way that you're using also count variables on this to see also maybe um, levels of trauma or more exposure? And do you have any information also on how long they were in their journeys? Because of course, usually the longer the journey takes, the more likely the trauma also. Um, and I'm not sure if you have any information also on how their economic situation before they migrated. Because one of the things that we know with a lot of refugees is the better off refugees can make this journey much faster and are therefore then much less likely to be victimized. Um, so there are a lot of other things mixed up in there. And I'm just wondering if you can get um, at a bit more of this also. Thanks. Yes, um, maybe maybe let me answer the, the last two points that I can leave the, the count uh, of traumas to, to Teresa because I, I think she's looked into that uh, quite a bit over the past uh, weeks. Um, so yeah, first of all, the, 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 the positive answer I can give you is that we, we, we looked into all of this. Um, so the duration of the journey, we actually have information uh, precisely by day even. So we know exactly how long people traveled. Um, we, so we, we experimented with this a little bit. So of course, as you said, the longer the, longer the journey, the more likely it is for people to to, uh, to get victimized. I mean, that's very clear. Um, actually, what we find is, and that, that kind of substantiates also that people report these events correctly, is that incarceration in particular uh, leads to a, a longer journey. So of course, if you're, if you're in prison, it takes longer. And, and that's the main variable that makes the journey by about, makes longer by about 15 days. Uh, all the others only slightly extend the, the duration of the journey. Um, so the problem with this journey variable is that when we when we include it as a control variable, we can do that, right? And it, it, the results are very robust to that, even even though it's, it's almost strange because of course they're they're correlated, right? I mean by by design almost. Um, but even when we include them, the, the coefficients that we get are almost exactly the same. So that's quite reassuring. Um, at the same time, we think that it's not really a control variable that we want to uh, include by default because of this uh, correlation between uh, between the duration of the journey and, and, and the victimization event. Uh, but what we do also in terms of taking this off. Just a quick Sorry. note. So we do have in our, uh, in our lasso version, in uh, the specification for in the cross section, we do have uh, the duration of the journey. So we right, right. include that there, it's not a preferred specification because it's really a data-driven method. And as we said, there might be things that might create the problems at large set, but so this first specification that was shown in Sables, it does include the duration of the journey and all specifications include the economic situation relative to the average in the country. So it's, um, it's, a, it's a scale that asks, how do you think, do you think you stand economically relative to the other people? In your home country, so no. yeah, so exactly. So we have we have um, information on all these things, and then uh, maybe I don't know, Teresa, should I comment or do you want to comment on the on the count variable? So yes, yeah. we we can count these 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 traumatic events, but yeah, I leave that to you. So we 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 did several experiments. So we did the um, linear sum with this with the quadratic with the uh, sum of uh, physical and financial victimizations, and we we don't find that there is. A significant different effects so or the magnitude of the coefficient doesn't really differ whether you had one or you had two or, or, or more. So just the fact that you had um, one and two, the, of course, two or three is, is slightly larger, but we do find still that the, the, the difference in the coefficient is not so big. So we do have this in the paper in the later section, but we just didn't present it here um, just for the sake of time. But yeah. Exactly. And maybe, maybe one, thing, one thing to add to that as well is um, so it seems that uh, some of the, 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 the victimization events drive the results a bit more than others. So, for example, physical assault um, has a, like a stronger effect uh, than, than other victimization events. And uh, so we think like we would then have to kind of combine these individual specific effects and then you kind of get uh, you know, to a point where you just don't have a lot of variation anymore in, in, in your data. Um, so that's also one of the reasons why we don't think that we would uh, find much more um, when we Kind of compare uh, the sum or the, 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 the different levels of victimization. Yeah. Um, if Melissa is done with her question, 
Uh, Ali has a question and I'll read it out for you. Do you think the physical trauma effect you observe among refugees is unique or is the observed impact of trauma reflective of a more general psychological consequences of trauma? Also want to ask about origin country factors. Thank you, Ali. Thanks for sure. <laughs> yeah, thanks for thanks for your questions. By the way, uh, that's 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 great. Um, yeah, so so um, our so the, the way we we think about it, given the literature, we think that it is this this kind of effect on refugees is fairly unique due to the situation they're in. I mean, if you well, if you put an individual like I, and I'm just talking like hypothetically here, right? Because because I, I have not seen any literature on this, but I would have I would expect if you if you put an individual that is in a similar situation as a refugee, so someone who say just graduated from high school and has to decide whether or not to enter the labor market into low skill employment, or um, or spend more time on education, if you put this um, if you put this individual into a similar situation of victimization. We would, given the literature that, that that we've read on the topic, expect a similar uh, similar similar effect. But uh, of course, this is like a pretty like niche situation for people to be in when you when you zoom out into the general population. Uh, whereas it's it's the it's the baseline uh, situation for refugees, right? Because everyone is in that situation when they arrive. So um, yes, in that sense, um, without going on a limb here and, and and claiming any knowledge on the psychological drivers that are that are truly behind it. Um, I would I would personally expect from the literature I read that you would also see this effect in, in other populations given a similar po uh, um, situation. Yeah. And that on the country of origin. Um, so I ask also, that? Yeah. So I have a question that I wanted you to comment on something that's not what you studied. So that's one of those questions. Like, can you ask for, answer my question about what you didn't study? So you said you have all these great origin kind of context factors right in your data and I'm just curious if again this isn't something you did but is there a way to maybe start um, maybe uh, parsing out some of these different kind of motivations decision making factors that people made I mean of the refugees that left like what were the differences between different people that left at different times or in terms of I'm wondering is there a way to unpack it a bit the Syrian refugee crisis or just refugee migration in particular, and I, I'll tell you why I'm interested in that. It's more from a theoretical point of view. In the general theories of migration, why people move around economic migration, there's a quite a bit of a nuance about how these things work. But when it comes to like the refugee kind of decision-making and that, that part of it within like general migration studies, it's kind of given to like a black box, like, oh, they're forced to move. And it's kind of like, that's it. We, we, we kind of stop there. We don't go any further about what are the kind of particularities of what's happening about five refugees in the same place, same war zone, are all the decisions the same? Like, are things different? Like, what are those factors? And I'm just curious, do you think maybe this data set you have is perhaps might be able to unpack some of that? Thank you. Yeah, yeah, thanks for the question. I, I think that's that's very interesting. Uh, um, I don't know, because I, I, you just come in if you if you if you want to give your take on this, of course. Um, so my take on this is we can disentangle some of this uh, based on this rich set of, of variables that we have. So they, 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 they the variables that we have include information, for example, on the motivation for for leaving the the host country. Uh, the thing is, though, that um, since our sample is from 2013 to 2016, uh, Syrians indeed make up for the vast majority of people. And most people say that they came for humanitarian reasons. Uh, so that's the number one reason. What we can, what we can tell is that sometimes, uh, so people are allowed to give multiple answers there, right? And we can see that, that some people also um, say that they also came for economic reasons on top of this uh, humanitarian reasons. So I, I think what, what you're suggesting is to kind of explore more and I guess maybe that's not part of this particular paper, but I, I, it's certainly interesting um, to explore more why and in what context uh, these reasons for migration to change. And we do have all these background variables. Like for example, we can clearly say if this person migrated from a war zone because we have the data on the number of fatalities in the region prior to migration, and then whether or not these regions, uh, reasons change and, and how, what are the elasticities between these things. I think that's, that's, that's super interesting and it uh, certainly can be done given the data, but um, yeah, I guess for this project, it, it's already pretty, a, a pretty ambitious project. So uh, um, we're trying to stick uh, to the <laughs> domain findings for now, but uh, thanks, it's a, it's a good idea, I think. Yeah. Sorry, my screen froze for a second. Can you hear me? Yes. 
Great. Uh, so uh, I think we can take two more questions. We already have one question from Anna. Uh, so she's asking you, did you also take into account family educational characteristics of refugees, for instance? Those having children may have more pressure to work rather than to study. Those that have more years of education may be more willing to study further instead of accepting low wage jobs. Those that know already another language apart from their mother tongue may have more chances to learn good German and then start studying. So I can, I can answer that. So we do control. We, we even control if, the, if they have children, if the children are living in the same household, if the children are living in a different household in Germany, or if children are living are li in another country abroad. We do the same for the spouse. So we do know where the spouse is staying. We do not know if they speak other language, but we know uh, if they spoke German before migration. And uh, yeah, but this is basically what we can do by controlling at least by country of origin fixed effects. We also control in a sense for mother tongue language, which might be close or not, uh, or more difficult to learn German, but yeah, I'd say that's it. And we control for education uh, before migration and then overall education acquired uh, after in Germany. And, and, and maybe just one sentence to add to that. Um, so the other thing is, like, this is of course a very relevant point, right? And, and very true. At the same time, you always have to think about whether we would expect a relation between these variables and the victimization experience. So, um, so, I mean, of course, these may have an effect on whether or not you take up employment, but they may not affect um, the, the victimization experience. And then uh, it would just be kind of a control variable that you add to kind of get more precision to your estimates, but it's not necessarily a confounder, right? And, uh, but I agree with you. I mean, they might be correlated also with the victimization event, but that's kind of something like kind of the, the, the conceptual way that, that we have to think about it uh, when, when we include these, uh, these, these, these control variables in the regression, yeah. Thank you, Lars. Do we have any other questions? Okay, then uh, let's uh, conclude with the seminar. Anyway, Lars and Teresa, both of them, if you just Google their names, you're gonna find their email. So if you have any other questions at any point of time, I'm sure you can email them and they'll, uh, they'll take care of your question. Otherwise, uh, let me just quickly tell you that our next event is this month on the 24th. And actually the speaker is with us here today in the seminar. Uh, she, she's uh, Cordula Bieri, and she will be presenting um, a, a study on asylum seekers um, and refugees' health and well being during the pandemic in Ireland, the role of integration and ethnic equality mainstreaming. Thank you very much for this great presentation. Again, it will be available very soon on YouTube once uh, we can process the video. And looking forward to welcoming you all uh, again um, in a couple of uh, days uh, for the next seminar. Enjoy the rest of your day, and it was very nice seeing you all today.